Good morning, Your Honors. The matter before the court this morning is the case entitled The State of Vermont versus Gregory Manning, docket number 2016-141. Representing the appellant, Gregory Manning, is Marshall Paul. Seated at council table with Mr. Paul is, down, is Don Matthews. Representing the appellee, the State of Vermont, is Heidi Remick. Well, good morning. Uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here, uh, VLS students, uh, I think, probably, and some professors, but in particular, Hartford High School is here, I understand, and we're very happy to see you here, uh, and uh, Sharon Academy as well. Uh, it's very nice to have you all here. So, having said that, let's get started. Council, will you come on up, please? Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. There was no dispute in this case that the key piece of evidence was the video from inside the bank that showed whether or not Mr. Manning had deposited money with the teller on the days after he had not been able to deposit it in the night deposit box. I would dispute that that's undisputed. The fact is that none of the bank records showed any deposit into that account of those specific funds that were charged in the information. The bank records themselves versus a video of people coming and going on the inside of the bank. Your Honor, not having the video, there's no way to know because if the video showed what Mr. Manning said that the video would show, it would exonerate him. And if the video but the, showed... But the video show him walking into the bank, maybe even going up to the window. How does that counteract the evidence of three deposits not registering by the bank? The bank would have had to have messed up three different deposits in its record keeping. Messed up or the fraud could have come from some other source. The fraud could have come from someone within the bank. It certainly would have been exonerative evidence if the video had in fact shown. So, so let me go on that point. Let's say no video. We're actually back in the pre-video world. Um, <laughs> your client is a backup on taking things there and so most of the time, as I understand the facts, he's not the one that's depositing the money. It just happens that on three times than when he is depositing the money, there's no record of it ever being received. Wouldn't that have been a very, very strong case against your client, even in the pre-video world? Even in the pre-video world, Your Honor, that would have been evidence against my client. But the fact is this is not in the pre-video world. This is in the world where there was video recorded and the state made absolutely no effort to preserve that video, despite the fact that the state was clearly on notice that that was relevant because from the very beginning, the first day of the investigation, Mr. Manning's defense was the bags didn't go in the drop that night, but I took them to the bank the next day and deposited them with a teller. If there had been video that showed that, the state's case would have been much weaker, if not destroyed completely. Um, the, the state, in fact... But the video, doesn't it just show people in the lobby? It doesn't hone in on the transactions, that would be a violation of privacy rights in the bank. So he could have been going there and cashing his own check for a hundred bucks or depositing in his own account. It still certainly would have gone, gone a long way towards supporting Mr. Manning's account of, of what happened. And honestly, we don't know exactly what's in the video because the video was never preserved. The state has an affirmative duty to preserve any evidence that's relevant to the case. And in this case, it's clear that the evidence was relevant because Mr. Manning, on the first day of the investigation, told the police officer who was interviewing him that he had gone to the bank the next day to deposit the money and that the video would show that. Well, in fact, the, the, uh, it's in the affidavit of prob probable cause that the police officer filed, I think, isn't it? Doesn't he reference having watched the video or videos, if you will? He does, and that actually puts this even more squarely into the realm of evidence that the prosecution had a duty to preserve. If, there was, if this was a case where it wasn't clear that there was video in the first place, or if you know, it wasn't clear that the video was of a type that would have shown uh, what happened in the bank that day, like if the, if the uh, officer, for example, had gone in and viewed the video and seen that the you know, the camera was facing towards a potted plant and didn't even show who came and went from the bank. That would be one thing. This is a case where we know that there was video that showed 
exactly what Mr. Manning said it would show, which is whether or not he came and went from the bank. That puts it in the realm of evidence that the prosecution has a duty to preserve, and which in this case, they made absolutely no effort to preserve. Um, now, and, let, let me be clear about this. The bank made the decision to erase the video, right? Yes. And they made it before any case was filed against the defendant. Yes. So there was no case at that time at all, right? There's no evidence that the video existed after the case was filed. Right. I, I don't, don't think don't, it's completely we, clear from We that. actually don't know exactly when uh, the video was erased. It's not in the record, right? Correct. It's just, we just know it wasn't available for trial. Correct. And even after the case started, um, there was a considerable term in which uh, your client was represented and could have said, oh, and by the way, uh, we want that video preserved, uh, but never did. Not anywhere up until the trial and finding at the trial time, it's not now there. There's no evidence that the video was available by the time the case was charged. Um, by the but time there's no evidence to the contrary, is there? No, but that did not stop the prosecutor from at closing argument telling the jury exactly the opposite. With no evidentiary support, the prosecutor was allowed to argue to the jury that the defense could have gotten the tapes and didn't, when in fact, from the evidence, that was unlikely, certainly an open question. But and the defendant unlikely. never made a motion to preserve the thing. So uh, prior if the defendant never does it, how do, we, how do we say the facts are? Prior to being charged, the defendant asked first to view the video and then to have the video preserved. And the bank refused to do both. The bank refused to let him view the video, even though it had allowed the uh, detective or the, the police officer to view the video. And it refused to preserve the video absent a subpoena, which of course he couldn't get because he had not been charged. And you can't get, get a subpoena in a case that doesn't exist. OK, I'm uh, a little unclear on exactly what video you think should have been preserved, because uh, your client wasn't very specific on at least one of the instances on which day it was that he went into the bank. So what's to prevent, so the bank saves t two or three days worth of, of tape and he's not on it. What's to prevent him from saying, well, it was the next day? Or no, it was the next day, or it was the next day? Well, the, the, the duty to preserve is not absolute. The duty to preserve is to preserve what's relevant. If a client said something and it was unclear and they had made an effort, any effort, to preserve the video, then they would have a much stronger argument that they didn't fail the uh, Bailey-Delisle test. But the Bailey-Delisle test rests in part on the, uh, you know, the, the extent of culpability of the state. And in this case, where they made absolutely no effort, you know, that's, that's not even a question. If it would be, I agree that it would be a much closer case had they, for example, preserved the tapes that they thought were relevant and then it turned out that those weren't the days that the client was talking about. That would not be negligent. That would not be bad faith. In this case, though, uh, it's clearly negligent because the officer went and he looked at the tape and the tape, he was, the officer was clear that he was looking at the tape from the day that the defendant had said was the day that he had gone to deposit the money and he didn't preserve the evidence even though he absolutely in, could have. In, in court, as the state uh, put on its evidence, how central to the state's case uh, was uh, this evidence surrounding the video or the videos uh, in question? Well, I think it was central because basically there was no other facts that were being contested. There was no, no one was contesting that Mr. Manning had taken the money from the, uh, from the gas station, taken it to the night deposit box, uh, not put it in the night deposit box, and instead left the night deposit box area with the money. The only hey, but question- there were other there were other facts that were contested. The, one was that the, the uh, bottom was not working on the, on the uh, safe deposit box, the uh, night deposit box, I should say. The bank denies that. But ultimately, the, that, that would not have decided the outcome of the case. Whereas if Mr. Manning had, in fact, gone to the bank and deposited the money with the teller, that would have been determinative of the outcome of the case. That would not be embezzlement because it would not, that would, the state's case would fail on one of the elements of embezzlement, which was the, the uh, permanently depriving the uh, business of that money if Mr. Manning had, in fact, done what he said he did and what he said would be revealed had that type tape been preserved. So it was more part of the state's rebuttal to his defense. It wasn't necessarily central to the state's case in chief, but in its answer to his defense, that was, that was the evidence they relied on is what they saw in the video. 
Certainly. I mean, I think that's that would be an accurate way of, of framing it. And I think that <clears throat> what's what makes it a particularly prejudicial error is how it was used, that that was then leveraged in the closing argument where the prosecutor was allowed to argue to the jury that the defense could have preserved this evidence itself and did not when there was absolutely no evidence to that point. And that was particularly bad when it was layered upon the other closing argument errors. Um, in particular, the, the prosecuting attorney referred to the defense, that, that referred to the entire defense, which, you know, defendants are always allowed to comment on missing evidence, on lack of evidence, on uh, the weakness of an investigation. And in this case, the prosecutor characterized that, uh, impugned that defense by saying that that was nothing more than saying, hey, look, a squirrel, that it was a distraction defense, and that the prosecutor was blowing hot air. There's no difference between that and what this court has for decades uh, condemned and prohibited, you know, going back to Francis when this court said you can't have a uh, closing argument where you accuse the, uh, the defense of putting up a smoke screen or in scales more recently criticizing the prosecution for claiming that the defense was uh, smoke and mirrors and then went on to, um, went on to then argue, of course, the lack of preservation of the evidence to turn that around and say that it was the defense's fault and the defense's burden when in fact it's the prosecution that bears the burden of preserving evidence. If there's no further questions, okay. I'll reserve the remainder of my time. Thanks very much. Counsel? Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. The reality of this case is that the defense benefits more from the idea of the missing videos than the actual videos themselves. Uh, as the court has already honed in, the missing interior video was not central to the state's case. It related only to the missing November 27th deposit, which the defendant testified he had brought to the bank on a later date did not relate to the other three missing deposits. But, but, but the notion that it wasn't relevant, I mean, you would agree that in light of defendant's alibi or explanation, which he gave immediately when he was interviewed, that is either going to be inculpatory or exculpatory. It's not irrelevant. I would agree with that. But the officer was in a catch-22 <clears throat> after hearing the defendant's explanation that he returned the money uh, initially, he said the next day, but it turned out the next day was Thanksgiving. When confronted with that, he told the officer, oh, it was the Friday or Saturday after. So the officer reviewed the video and testified in depositions and very briefly at trial that he didn't see the defendant on the video. At that point, the officer was in a catch-22 because the bank told him he needed a warrant to get a copy of the video. Having not seen anything relevant to the case on the well, video, he couldn't. He felt he could. What makes? I mean, how, how could it warrant? possibly be not relevant if it if it if it if it shows that the the explanation offered by defendant can't have been true? It, it strikes me as absolutely relevant, which is why, I mean, allowing the officer to testify that he didn't see anything mm -hmm. w without having just provided the video to the other side or made it available strikes me as a getting it both ways. I agree, Your Honor, in hindsight it is relevant and had, you know, the state been approached about this ahead of time, we would have made more of an effort to but well, was the, it the, the preservation of discovery? request was never made of the state. There were no pretrial There was motions. no discovery about this? There was discovery about this. The bank employees and the officer were both deposed, testified that they had reviewed the videos, but there was no request made of the state to turn over those videos pre-trial. Does the state have an obligation? Do you have to, does the state have to wait for a request to turn over relevant videos? No, the state doesn't. And in hindsight, again, the state, you know, had that issue been spotlighted the way it was at trial, the state would have made more of an effort to obtain the video. But it wasn't in a spotlight until trial. At depositions, the defense was focusing as much on whether or not the bank's policies regarding um, control of what happened to the night deposits after they got to the bank uh, was it at issue at every bit as much as the interior videos. I think the state's main point is that 
the missing video related only to the November deposit. In hindsight, yes, in a perfect world, we would have obtained that video, but in the absence of it, it's not central to the case. There's still plenty of evidence, given the other three missing deposits that the video had nothing to do with, that the jury could have and likely would have reached the same verdict. But don't you walk into a non-unanimity problem with that argument? In other words, if you're now saying there's four separate distinct incidents on different dates that could have supported this conviction, did the, did the judge instruct the jury that it had to uh, find unanimity as to which incident it was relying on, or that half the jury could find that he did it in October and half the jury could find it in January and that would support a conviction? The dif I don't recall that the judge made that specificity, um, but... There was some discussion of the fact at trial that the state could have brought this as four separate counts and it worked to the defendant's benefit because he was facing only one, um, one count of embezzlement that it was charged as one count within the period and from there was October no request, to January. I and there was no request from the defense. Uh, can I, specify, yeah. can I ask you another a question about the centrality or the non-centrality of this evidence in your case? Did, I, I understand it was part of your closing argument, and that's some of the issue that's here, but was it also part of your opening statement as well? Your Honor, it was a, I, I was reminded in the uh, appellant's answer that I had briefly related to it in the opening. I had said that the bank staff had reviewed the video, but again, prior to trial, the video of the interior from the November deposit was only glancingly relevant in that it was part of a lot of evidence that bank staff had reviewed looking for these missing deposits. They reviewed the Amadeo, the victim's bank records, looking to see if the deposits had been put in on another date. They looked in other deposits to see other accounts to see if they had been deposited to the wrong account. Uh, the bank conducted and discussed it at trial that they had done their own investigation looking for these missing deposits. Thanks. Um, the lost evidence rule objection was not preserved at trial. At trial, the defendant objected on hearsay grounds, and the court ruled that the video was not a statement, and on best evidence ground, and the court ruled that the video fell within exceptions to the best evidence rule. And it is not error for the trial court to rule upon the objections placed before it, nor is it error for the court to have failed to consider an objection not raised at trial. And for the appellant to raise the lost evidence rule here, that, that is an objection that was not raised at trial and from the state's perspective is not preserved for appeal. So, as I recall the transcript, uh, nobody used the magic words lost evidence rule or Bailey, uh, but the argument was made that the state turned over all relevant, element, relevant evidence, did not turn this over, has never turned this over, and now they're trying to rely on someone's description of it as trial. Isn't that essentially the uh, stuff of a lost evidence objection, even if they didn't use the magic words? But even under lost evidence analysis, the result is the same. Uh, first of all, preliminarily, the lost evidence rule pertains to evidence lost by the state. This video, rightly or wrongly, was never in the state's position possession. We have discussed that, you know, in hindsight, the state would have requested it, but it never was in the state's possession. Um, the defense never requested the videos from the state, and uh, there is no reasonable possibility that the videos would have been exculpatory because, as noted previously, they only related to the one of the four missing deposits, the November deposit. And there was clear, compelling evidence as to three of the four stolen deposits of the defendant, which the video did, the jury did see these videos of surveillance video of the defendant on three of the four occasions approaching the night deposit box, opening it, putting a bag in, but taking it out again, 
and secreting it in his coat before walking away. So essentially pantomiming the act of making the deposit. The trial court at sentencing said that that was extremely compelling evidence. It could not be clearer what the defendant did. So, so that may be true, but I want to go back to the three, the, the notion that there's evidence on others. That sounds like a sufficiency of the evidence argument. If it were improper for the jury to be allowed to consider the one incident on account of the, the video not preserved, then I, wouldn't we have to, since we don't know what the jury's basis was for convicting, wouldn't we have to reverse if, if the uh, state's conduct was improper as it related to that, that incident? I don't think you would because, again, separating out the charges was never requested. On, it was never requested by the defense. It was never requested right, by but, the but then the effect, the, the effect of the error is but, that it, 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 we don't know, right? We don't, in other words, if there's, if there's five theories a jury could have relied on and, and one of them turns out to be uh, improper as a matter of law, can we say, oh, well, we're going to affirm because the jury could have gone on a different legal theory? I think that there are, there are four, four missing deposits, any one of which would have met the standard, uh, met the $100 threshold for the embezzlement charge. There is extremely compelling evidence in all of them, even with respect to this November one, even if it was error for that video to have been glancingly testified to by the officer because the bank uh, teller did not testify to the contents of the video. Even if that was error, and even with respect to the November deposit, there was plenty of other evidence by which the jury's verdict could but have been sustained. Let me, let me understand. You, you, you're making now, as I understand it, a harmless error argument. Um, uh, so can an error be harmless if the defendant testified that I didn't do it, whatever, I know this is a hypothetical, right? And 25 people testify, um, all people who there's no real indication would be lying uh, in any event, the police officer, the owner, the operator of the bank, uh, and all sorts of people who are at the bank uh, testify that no deposit was made by the defendant or no event that he testified to. Can we ever say it's harmless? Um, it's uh, uh, still one person's word against X number of other people. Uh, uh, even though that's strong evidence, can we ever say it's harmless in that, in that situation? I, I think you can say it's harmless because... It, so where's the number? If 10 people testify against you, uh, it's not? Or if uh, it is? Or where, how do I, where do I find this line? It's, it's not a number, Your Honor. It's, it's a matter of looking at the totality of the evidence. This doesn't go to a substantial right of the defendant because it's related only to part of the charged conduct. There was testimony by other witnesses that there was no problem with the way the night deposit box was working. The other person who made night deposits more often had no problem with the deposit box working. The bank staff had no complaints about it not working. So in light of all of that, it was perfectly appropriate excuse me, for the jury to essentially disregard the defendant's testimony that, the, that he had returned that one deposit, which only went to a quarter of, of the conduct that underlied the defense. If we uh, disagree with you and remand this case, would the state be free to charge this as four separate offenses in your view on remand? I think if if the court if this court were to set aside the the conviction, then yes, all bets would be off, and the state could proceed on a different theory and could amend the charges going forward. Uh, with respect to closing argument, um, the theme of closing argument was that it was the state's job to build the wall of evidence to prove the case which theme was actually illustrated by building a wall out of children's blocks. Uh, and so in that context, the argument was very clear from the beginning that the burden of proof was on the state and not on the defense. And the defendant's reliance on the brief on the case of Covington versus State of Florida is misplaced 
because there the missing video was of the crime itself rather than a collateral issue. Here the video evidence, there was video evidence of the defendant committing the crime and the missing video only went to a piece of the defendant's alleged offense whether or not he visited the bank on a different day. Would you, usually when we talk about collateral, it's some incidents that's not, goes, doesn't go to the central question, innocence or guilt. I would think that a video that went to the question of whether his defense was, was well founded wouldn't be collateral. It would be core to the guilt or innocence of the Well, it, it, again, as the court has pointed out, if that video had been available, it, there's no, it, it might likely have shown whether or not the defendant entered the bank, but would not have given us the details of what he did there, the fact would remain that the deposit he claimed to have brought in never made it into the bank's accounting. Uh, so it still would not have been dispositive of his alleged defense. Um, and the state in closing never said that the defendant had an obligation to subpoena the video, only that he had the power to do so. And it was perhaps an artfully an attempt to articulate the point that the defendant's case is better served by the idea of the missing video so that they can, uh, as they have done, make an issue of sloppy police investigation, a rush to judgment it, by the it, bank, than by the video itself, which would not have even been dispositive had it existed. But, but, but that statement, is it true, right? Now, you're, you're distinguishing between whether he had the obligation to subpoena it versus the opportunity. But is it true that he even had the opportunity? Certainly, Your Honor. How? I, I mean, I think we would have at least known, there, as the court has noted, there was no, there's no evidence of when the bank rewrote those videos. Um, but we would have known prior to trial, certainly if the defense had made an effort to get them, um, and they didn't. This was an issue that was sprung on, sprung on the state at trial. Thanks very much. Thank you. Appellant has four minutes and 30 seconds remaining. So I think, Your Honors, that that's exactly the point, is the defendant did try, as the prosecutor said, prior to trial, to procure the tape. And it wasn't just one tape. The defendant, in a letter to the bank uh, so we So we go back officer. to uh, uh, what I understand so that I can pick up is uh, why it was denied. He asked for the tape, and the uh, bank said uh, the federal law, uh, a tape of lots of people interacting with the bank, uh, prohibits me from giving you that uh, unless you get a subpoena. Yes. Um, is there anything wrong with that answer? It strikes me uh, from looking at it that from the bank's standpoint, that probably was right. No, but I think what it does is it illustrates why it's the prosecution's duty to preserve that evidence, because the defendant can't do it. The prosecution certainly could have gotten a warrant. The whole argument that the prosecution could not have gotten a warrant in well, this case Well, we have is devices under which the defendant could have done it. I mean, I understand that uh, practically speaking, unrepresented as he was under those circumstances, that it's unlikely he's going to do it. But we do have ways to uh, enforce the preservation of evidence, don't we? Not prior to being charged, not that the defendant can avail themselves of. So only this that will the mean, it, it, can so let's say I agree themselves. with you on that point. So that will mean if evidence is destroyed prior to any kind of charge, uh, the defendant always walks away because there's no way to know what it would have said or done, and he has no way of getting it. Not at all, Your Honor. Bailey and Delisle provide for a flexible remedy. It's not an automatic dismissal. Um, Bailey and Delisle provide only for dismissal in the most egregious of cases, cases of bad faith, cases where the evidence is so central to the case. I think that probably the remedy that would have been appropriate in this case is the remedy the defendant sought at trial, which was just don't allow the police officer to testify about what he saw on the tape when the defendant is precluded from being able to rebut or effectively cross-examine because the defendant never had the opportunity to procure the tape or to watch the tape. And so all we're left with is what I'm, the police I'm officer says of Why is that the right remedy? You've got two people who looked at the tape. They have evidence to say what's on it. Um, why, are they, why would it be appropriate to prohibit them from uh, testifying to what they saw? Because that would be the appropriate remedy under Bailey and Delisle. But it because starts of with the, there was something done wrong, and therefore you're doing a remedy to correct it. Yes, and under so Bailey, Bailey and Delisle. So Bailey and Delisle, we're trying to understand whether something did wrong. Yes, and failing to preserve the evidence. Because Bailey says that 
um, before a request for discovery has been made, the duty of disclosure is operative as, as the duty of preservation. Anything that you would have to turn over because it's relevant evidence for Brady, you have to preserve prior to uh, dis the discovery mechanisms kicking in. That was actually was quoted in Bailey, but that was from uh, Bryant, uh, one of the U.S. one of the federal cases. I assume um, we agree with you, and the case gets remanded. Uh, same question that I asked opposing counsel. Can the state now charge your client with four felonies? Sure, I think so, though I think that taking a look, or even at the prosecutor's closing argument in this case, the prosecution almost conceded that the evidence was very weak as to the October deposit. Um, it was, there, the, the December deposit involved facts that were sort of different than the other ones. So there was a lot of, um, you know, I, I think they certainly could charge five more. Whether there would even be, whether whether like the October deposit would even survive a 12D, I don't know. Um, but I do think that also illustrates the problem that if there's a failure at one point here, there's a failure of the whole thing because there was no unanimity instruction given in this case. Oh, well, no, that wasn't asked for. <laughs> but whether it was asked for or not, what that does, it's not about whether there was a, whether there was an error for failing to give the instruction. It's about what the result of the error is in this court. If there's an error that affects one of the potential theories of conviction in this case, we have no way to know whether half the jury, you know, decided on that one and half the jury decided on another one. But you got to give the you got to give the trial court a chance to rectify that. You can't just sit back and then come up here and say, well, that was. It was a mischarge to the jury. I don't think it much was a mischarge to the jury. If the prosecution charges four different incidents and says, here are four different incidents, I think they have to prove four different incidents. Um, and if one of those incidents but fails the, on appeal. But I don't see that the information here even talks about the incidents. It's just simply that they, the defendant did it. And this strikes me as an argument you could have been making even if you didn't claim there was an error. That is, you would come out and say, uh, this needs to be overturned because the jury was never told to uh, separate out the four incidents and agree on only one. And I'll be brief because my time is up, but I think that the answer to that question is there's a difference between claiming an instruction error and claiming a um, claiming a, essentially a form of remedy because of the error. Okay. And I think that's the, that's the difference here, Your Honor. Thank you very much. The next hearing for the court will follow immediately.